There we go. Once again, welcome. We are going on a trip tonight to Tuscany and your host is Camden local resident, Nancy Harmon Jenkins. She is a food writer. She is heavily involved in our community here in Camden. She has published eight cookbooks. I highly recommend you checking out her website. She'll tell you a little bit about that later and how to locate that. She's written thousands of articles and she's just kind of an all around cool lady. Um, I am very very pleased that I have the, um, the opportunity to work with Nancy on several of our programs here at the library, including our energy series that she has just been invaluable in her contributions to. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Nancy to take us away to Italy. Nancy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now and share your screen. Okay, and share my screen. There we go. And now I have to go to something to make this work. If you hit the little green button, you'll have some choices pop up. All right. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for getting me, you know, kind of a klutz with, uh, with all of this device business. I, I've only been doing it for about 25 years and I'm still getting used to it. Um, thank you, Julia. Thank you to the Camden Public Library for giving me an opportunity to talk about my life in Tuscany. I call this talk Dolce Amaro because it is a bittersweet tale. It's a tale of my life in Tuscany, the sweetness of nostalgia looking back on everything that's happened and the often bitter taste of change because change happens everywhere. Life is not life without change. And sometimes change can be heart stabbingly difficult. 50 years ago, precisely in May of 1971, I went to Tuscany and bought a farm and this is what it looked like. It was a stone cottage, very small, very contained. It had been abandoned some years earlier and it had 10 hectares, that's about 25 acres of land. See the grapevines, it was still, even though it had been abandoned, the grapevines were still producing there. It sat on a low hill in the middle of a valley that stretched west to east from the heights of the mountains east of Cortona called the Montagna Cortonese. It's, it sloped all the way down east into the upper Tiber Valley in Umbria. And this is the view on a misty day in autumn of the hills of Umbria. It looks like a, a Chinese landscape, doesn't it? I had no idea what I was getting into. At the time, I was married to an extremely profligate man, as he would probably be the first to admit. We had a little money saved up, which was unusual, and it seemed like a good idea to me to put it in real estate. Friends had bought a similar abandoned farm in this same community, and they inspired us. The fact that we lived in Beirut, Lebanon, and had almost no connection whatsoever to Italy, didn't stop us. So we went ahead. Uh, we went to Italy, we bought a farm, and then we hired an architect to restructure this tumbling ruin that we had inherited and make a proper house of it while we watched from a distance. Two years later, we moved to Hong Kong, which was even farther away. But in fact, from that date in May of 1971 until COVID struck last year, I managed to spend sometime in that house every single year. Sometimes it was just a few days, a few weeks, and other times it was several months. And the house grew and evolved and became what we now call home. And this is what it looks like now. It's a little different from that tumble down structure, but still there's a lot of it that's very much the same. I didn't know it at the time, but living in that place was to change my life profoundly and along the way, give me deep insights into Italian history, Italian culture, Italian civilization, and above all, Italian cuisines. And note, please, that plural, for there is no one Italian cuisine. We can't talk about Italian cooking or la cucina italiana, it doesn't exist. Instead, like Italian dialects and Italian traditions, there are many regional Italian cuisines from Piemonte in the Northwest to Puglia in the Southeast and from Venice to Sicily and everywhere in between. So how is it that we were able to buy 25 acres of land and a tumble down house for the equivalent of about $5,000? Even half a century ago, that was pretty astonishing. A knowledgeable Italian friend said at the time, I would not think that 
anywhere in Italy. You could find 10 hectares of land at that price. But the reason is very simple. The peasant farmers, the contadini, were abandoning their farms, fleeing the countryside and flocking to towns where work was available. It was tough work, but it wasn't as tough as towing a field in these stony, bony, unyielding mountains. And furthermore, at the end of the month, the worker had his busta paga, his, um, his, uh, his paycheck, which no farmer ever saw. Now I need to give you another little piece of Italian history uh, because Tuscany especially, uh, really since about the ninth century, that is for a thousand years or so, had been the home of a system called mezzadria, which was a very insidious form of sharecropping in which ideally the landowner supplied the fields, the housing, the seeds, and the necessary tools uh, and the, the rudimentary equipment that they needed to operate the farm, rudimentary equipment like this. And this photo was taken in the market in Camuccia, which is Cortona's major market, several years ago, probably several decades ago, in fact. Uh, the tools, as you can see, almost, you can tell by looking at them, they were handcrafted by local artisans. Today, there are similar tools on offer, but they're almost all made in China. In return for supplying all that, the landlord received half of everything produced. That meant half the wheat, half the wine, half the oil, half the lettuces and eggs and tomatoes. And if a sheep produced two lambs, the landlord got one of them. And if, as often happened, there were only enough beans to provide the Contadino's family through the winter, the landlord still got half. You get the picture. So this was a situation that had been in effect for centuries, but as Italy picked itself up from the ruins of World War II, and I think we tend to forget nowadays that Italy was a thoroughly ruined country by the end of the war. And a great wave of reform swept over the country after 30 years of fascism. And at that point, the large estates were broken up and farming shifted from local family-centered sharecropping subsistence economies to modern consumer-based agricultural capitalism. That is a kind of brief wrap up of what was actually a very complicated process that went on over decades. And Tuscans, along with other Italians, left their farms in droves, deserted them, abandoned them, moved away, and that's how my family came to buy one of those deserted farms, 25 acres of steep, rocky, heavily forested land with a tumble down farmhouse for a mere $5,000. But not everyone was in that situation. Uh, this is a farm of our neighbors, the Antolinis. It's a very grainy old photo taken back there in the, in the early 70s. And the Antolinis, and yes, we believe on a lot of evidence that they are related to the main Antolinis, Tony Antolini from the uh, Bowdoin Music Department and his, his, his family. The Antolinis became beloved friends over the years. But the important point to note about them is that they were not contadini. They were not working land that belonged to someone else. They owned their own land, although in other respects, they lived like peasant farmers. They owned their own land, but they raised their own crops for their own uses. And they rarely had contact with the world outside this community, which back then probably numbered not more than 300 souls. This is a fuzzy photo, but you can see what their farm looked like back then. Their house, like ours, was built of local stone, which someone long ago had dug from the surrounding mountains. And you will notice that there were no wires leading to the house. They had no electricity, no telephone, no running water inside the house. They had water piped to the dooryard, but that was it. They had no mechanized transportation except the motorbike that the boy rode back and forth to school in Cortona, which was 12 miles away over some very twisty, turny mountain roads. They were living almost entirely on what they produced themselves and they were a last surviving niche of that old fashioned culture of subsistence farming and a direct contact with a 19th century way of life or even earlier. And that, as it turned out, was the greatest benefit for me and my family. Over all the years that we came and went, my children and I experienced a way of life that was to all intents and purposes unchanged since the 19th century. It was a tremendous gift. Take a closer look at the landscape. You see how small the fields are. 
That's because they were cultivated entirely with hand labor. They kept a mule, but they had no horse, no oxen, and of course, no tractor or mechanized farm equipment of any kind. And over there on the right, can I, you, yes, right here. Um, whoops, sorry. I'm gonna go back so you can see it again. Over here, you will see um, haystacks, piles of straw, uh, from threshing the wheat and other grains. And this was as vital to, uh, to um, as the wheat itself because it provided both bedding straw and fodder for the animals that they kept. But notice another thing, and now I'm gonna go to that second photo. It's again, very grainy old photos, but here you can see the terraces going down the hillside or up the hillside, depending on which direction you're going in. Those terraces are all planted to wheat or fava beans or oats or other grains. And uh, then they are lined with grapevines. You see the, where's my thing gone? Here are the grapevines that line the edges of the terraces. And that help, helps to hold the terraces in place at the same time, of course, that it provides uh, grapes for wine. And then dotted here and there, and here's a little branch sticking up here, particularly uh, there are olives. Um, Olives were not an important crop, not back then, but everyone kept a few trees from which they managed to eke out enough oil for the family needs. Most of the cooking back then was done with pork fat. And that's typical of these mountain communities where olives didn't thrive back then. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, it was done with a pork fat, which was either rendered lard, which is called strutto in Italian. And that's like what we call lard. Um, or it was, uh, or they used a cured pork fat, which confusingly is called lardo in Italian, but it doesn't mean what we call lard. It means the solid fat of the pig salted and cured, just like prosciutto is salted and cured. Or maybe a better uh, example is the salt pork that we use, especially here in Maine traditionally. So of course they kept pigs along with chickens and rabbits. And long ago, before we knew them, the Antolinis, like most of the people in these mountains, also kept sheep. They kept sheep for their wool, occasionally for the meat, but especially for the milk, which was the source of that famous Tuscan pecorino cheese, pecorino toscano. But sheep raising had almost entirely disappeared by the time we came on the scene, and the Antolinis had long since given up sheep. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Angelini family. They numbered at that time, six adults and one teenage son, Arnaldo, who is now in his sixties and is head of the household, the Capo di Casa. Back then the Capo di Casa was Agostino, born around the turn of the 20th century and a veteran of the bitterly fought Italian uh, campaign in World War I on the Northeastern Front. Uh, we forget about that when we talk about the World War. You know, we think about the front in, in France and Belgium, and actually it was a very bitter front that was fought between Austria and Italy uh, in Northeastern Italy. Our, Agostino was married to Diamante, her name means diamond. And uh, the others there were uh, Bruno, uh, who was the son of Agostino and Diamante, and Beppa, who was called La Pazza, the mad one, she never married. She lived at home. She was indeed quite strange. Bruno was married to Mita Angeli, who grew up in the same community. And they had three children, Fernanda and Anna, the two daughters who were, by the time we came there, they were married and living away, not very far away, but they weren't living on the family farm. And then Arnaldo, who was to grow up and marry Maura Gustanelli, another local girl, and their two daughters, Pamela and Sofia, who are now... Uh, adults as well. So uh, that was the situation, um, you know, going through the generations. But back then, uh, when Arnaldo was a 10-year-old kid when we arrived there, Agostino ran the place and the family lived pretty much outside a cash economy, pretty much. Um, there were pensions for military service for both Agostino and Bruno. And Mita had a disability uh, pension for a uh, lifelong scoliosis that she suffered from. I must say she didn't suffer very much. She didn't suffer much, she was really sharp. But in fact, there wasn't much need for cash since there were very few bills to pay. There were no electric or phone bills, of course. They didn't have to buy gas for a car or a farm machinery. They didn't need laundry detergent or toilet paper. What needs they had 
and that was for things like coffee and sugar and black pepper and salt. Those needs could be supplied through trading off products that they had available or selling what was available. Now, uh, some of those things were, Bruno uh, was a master charcoal burner. And this is Bruno in May building his charcoal burn in the middle of the forest when the woods are still very green and there's no danger of fire. And he would build that up. You can see the wood he's cut around the sides. All of it would be stacked up there. It would be covered over with turf and lit on the inside and burn slowly. Here he is with a completed um, burn. It would burn slowly over the course of weeks and it turned the oak and chestnut logs that he put into there into very high quality charcoal. It was in great demand from restaurateurs especially. They also sold off the pork that they had cured. The pigs were slaughtered in early winter uh, by a man who came around the house and supervised the slaughter. Uh, and also he, he cut the, the pig up. He didn't do the actual curing, but he cut the pig into the cuts that would be cured. Uh, he was called a Norcino. And it, it's interesting to me, he's called a Norcino because most of these men, not all of them, but most of them came from a town high up in the Umbrian mountains called Norcia. And so throughout that part of Italy, the, the man who did the butchering was called the Norcino. Once it was cured, then the extra salumi, and the salumi refers to all of the salted pork meats that they made. The extra salumi would be sold to Cortona markets and restaurants or in the butcher shop that one of the daughters maintained in Cortona. And the family also sold items that they foraged from the forest. And this is the prize. Um, anywhere you go in Tuscany, these are porcini mushrooms. And uh, they are in great demand in restaurants and in markets. In a good season, uh, you might get up very early in the morning, just at dawn and go down into the forest and collect a couple of kilos of fresh porcini. And then you'd walk up to the road with your basket and get the bus into Cortona in time for the morning market. And you would probably sell those out at a very good price in uh, an hour or so. So it was a good thing to do. These are all ways of putting a little money in the family purse and they have all disappeared with changes in the family structure as well as changes in the local economy. Nita's mother, Clorinda, who we have never, unfortunately I don't have a photograph of her. She was a very striking woman. She knew her way around probably a couple of dozen wild greens, things like wild poppy greens and chicories, all kinds of chicories and wild asparagus and wild hops uh, in great demand. And in springtime, she would put them all together in the most delicious salad. It was, uh, it was interesting because she also knew ways to use these wild greens in, um, for, for health purposes. You know, if you have to calm a fever or to cure an ache, a toothache or something like that. She had all those things. And Nita's granddaughters, Pamela and Sophia, I'm going to guess that they wouldn't know a dandelion from a daffodil, unfortunately. So Tiberina, where they live, is still to this day a very small hamlet, although it's the center of all the communities that stretch out along the ridge line east of Cortona. These are all considered part of the comune of Cortona, even though they're not in the city of Cortona. But despite the, the small size of the place, I have to say it is packed with stories, with histories that go back generations incorporating incest and murder and rape and kidnapping and internecine feuds and even romances that blossom into longstanding love affairs. Communities like this and, and even larger ones, much larger ones like Arezzo or Siena or even Florence, they illustrate what Italians call campanilismo, and that is a kind of tribal loyalty to the local community defined as all those close enough to hear the bells of the local campanile, the local church tower. Loyalty goes first to the family and then to the folks in the campanile and only then to the region and way, way down the list to the nation itself. And in fact, the people we call Italians are far more likely to call themselves Romans or Tuscans or Sicilians or whatever. Here in this community, we are just a few kilometers from the border with Umbria. And yet the Angelinis, like all the neighbors up there, are quick to describe themselves as Tuscans. Their dialect is Tuscan, their cooking is Tuscan, and their values are Tuscan too. Now, when Brita, Bruno and Nita were young, 
children like them were born, raised, schooled very briefly, usually just a couple of years, and then sent out at a young age, the boys to work in the fields, the girls to work in the kitchen of the farmyard. In the first years I lived there, it was Mita's job because she was, even though she was in her thirties at that point, she was the youngest adult female in the household. It was her job to take eight or 10 big white and black pigs out for a stroll in the forest every afternoon, watching over them as they gorged themselves on chestnuts and acorns and fattened up into a great source of protein that would keep the family going all winter long. This was a task she had been doing since she was 10 years old and stopped going to school. I'm pretty sure she and Bruno were functionally illiterate. They could sign a document they could read a signpost, but actually reading and understanding any kind of text was difficult. But they didn't need to read because they had a deep learning that was acquired over the years from what they had experienced and from what their elders had taught them. Now, I wanna show you here a few photos taken over the last 50 years that will give you an appreciation, I think, of how this family lived in the late 20th century. So you can understand how thrilling it was for me to participate in their lives. With no electricity, of course, they had no refrigerator or freezer, which meant that their winter supply of food was restricted and deeply traditional. Remember those terraced fields I showed you, wheat or fava beans on the terraces, grapevines bordering and holding the terraces in place, and then olive trees as a kind of exclamation point. Wheat, vines, olives, that's the Tuscan Trinity. It's the Mediterranean Trinity, in fact. It's the three facets of the Mediterranean diet, bread, wine, and olive oil that helped to make it one of the healthiest ways of eating that we know about. And wheat was fundamental to the table. This is a very blurry photo, but I love it because you can see the real color of wheat in Tuscany in uh, late May, early June, and the grapevines that stand out in contrast behind it. One of the very first encounters I had with the Angelini family was at the annual Trebiatura, which is the threshing of the wheat. Um, the wheat harvested in late June is left to stand in shooks like these until they're dry enough for threshing. And it is an extraordinary occasion, a sort of work party when all the neighbors get together to join in the effort. The only thresher in the, in the valley, the only threshing machine in the valley was owned by Orlando Rossi and he hauled it behind his tractor from one farm to another, successfully, successively far, uh, harvesting each farm's annual wheat harvest and threshing it into wheat grains. This is an old trebiatura and actually this was a demonstration that I came across of how it used to be in Tuscany. And you can see it's almost primitive technology. The thresher ran off the tractor motor and all day long men fed the sheaves of wheat into the maw of the machine. It was hard, dusty, hot work and liberally fueled by plenty of wine as well as copious amounts of salumi and cheese and bread and you know whatever came out of the household kitchen. And gradually the wheat piled up into glistening seeds packed with nutrients while the heaps of chaff grew taller and taller and eventually were piled in those towering hay mows we saw earlier. And at the end of the day, there was always a festa. And this was when I first met the Antolinis when Mija called me over because they were having a festa to celebrate the successful threshing of the wheat. There was a banquet under the shady chestnuts outside, abundant with food and wine, more than you could even imagine. And followed by dancing inside on the kitchen floor to the sound of the fisarmonica, which is the accordion. And this particular festa I want to show you, I will confess, is not in Tuscany. It was in the Abruzzi a couple of years ago, but it's typical of the kind of event that took place throughout central Italy when the harvest had been completed and the wheat had been put to bed for the winter. And this is amazing. There's a man inside there believe it or not, manipulating all of that and setting off those fireworks and the corn dolly dancing away to the music. You can just barely hear the music in the background. Uh, it's a wonder that he doesn't set fire to himself or the ground all around. See how dry it is. But um, this corn dolly dancing away to the music and the fireworks 
this to me is as ancient as anything in the Mediterranean, as ancient as Troy, as ancient as Knossos, as ancient as the pyramids of Egypt. And this was the wheat harvested here that was used by the Antolinis on that table every day. I go, whoops, stop. Uh, made into bread. Here is Mita in her kitchen making bread. Um, to be baked in the oven that was built into the house wall uh, on the ground, ground floor of the house. The kitchen was above the oven actually, and the oven sometimes when it was heated in the winter helped to keep the house warm. Um, and here she is with her bread all baked, just coming out. She baked, uh, I'm gonna say every 10 days or so. And this is the typical unsalted Tuscan bread that many of you who've traveled to Tuscany are probably familiar with and probably complained about. Um, Tuscans are famous for preferring their bread with no salt. And I think there's a reason for that. People will say, oh, it's because salt was taxed, but salt was taxed all over Italy. And it's only in Tuscany and Umbria that we have this unsalted bread. And there are other reasons that are equally spurious, I think. I think the reason for the unsalted bread is economy. Unsalted bread doesn't absorb moisture the way that salted bread does. And hence it tends to go dry without getting moldy. That's called pane raffermo, meaning firmed up bread rather than stale bread. And it's useful for all kinds of Tuscan treats from panzanella, the famous bread salad uh, made with, in the summertime with ripe tomatoes and lots of oil and vinegar to ribolicha. Now that's a wintertime treat. That's the bean and vegetable soup. That's uh, actually, it's, it's, um, it's leftovers basically mixed with substantial quantities of bread. And then there are the famous Tuscan um, crostini. I seem to have lost my arrow here. Where is it gone? There's a crostini. Uh, these are, um, it's a, it's a chicken liver pate, sort of sort of pate. It doesn't really look very pate-like. It's a crushed chicken liver with lots of great ingredients. And it's spread on those slices of pane raffermo, firmed up bread, which is not something, it's not fresh bread at all. It may have been toasted. It may have been fried. It may have been dipped in a little broth. And then the, um, the mashed chicken liver is put on top of it. And then there's always a slice of old bread that's put into the bottom of every soup plate. So this kind of ritual from the planting to the harvest, to the threshing, to the milling and making and baking the bread, sad to say, this doesn't happen any longer. There's no more wheat grown on the Angelini fields and no more tributura festivals taking place in our valley. That's because homegrown, home produced simply cannot compete with the cheap price of industrially produced wheat flour, most of it from the Western plains of the United States and Canada. So wine, on the other hand, and here's Bruno in his, in his uh, vineyard, um, wine has continued to be the pride of the household. And here, contrary to other products, the quality has increased enormously over the years. As Arnaldo, who went to a kind of agricultural technological high school in Cortona, has applied his learning uh, to the vineyards. Uh, these are mostly Sangiovese grapes, uh, which are the typical Tuscan grape, they're the basis of uh, Chianti Classico, for instance. And uh, they were usually grown on trellises like these to mark the boundary of those, um, those fields and, and terraces that we saw. And Arnaldo really never even bothers to harvest these grapes any longer. Uh, he actually produces a wine that is quite drinkable. He planted for himself a Merlot vineyard several decades ago. And even though I'm, uh, I'm not one to favor international varietals, the wine he produces is so superior to the thin, acrid, fizzy stuff that, that his father used to make that it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to have it. And they actually, they still make the wine on their property. They keep it in those old oak casks and they bottle it whenever they need wine on the table or when a guest arrives. Uh, and that's a very important thing to do when the guest arrives is to offer a glass of wine. I don't have any statistics at all, but I suspect that a good deal less wine is actually consumed in the household than used to be. And part of the reason may be um, the higher quality of the wine they're making, but it also is true that things like Coca-Cola and Fanta have crept onto the family table, alas. 
So olives are the third leg of the Mediterranean triad. And here there has been a great change. And it's one for which I claim a bit of credit myself. Years ago, when it became clear that I was not going to remain married to Mr. Jenkins and that I had to find some way to maintain these 25 very unproductive acres, I settled on the idea of planting olives. Uh, that was partly because they require a lot less work than vineyards do. Vineyard would have been an obvious thing to put in, but I wasn't about to make wine myself. It's difficult. It requires a certain skill and technique. Olives, on the other hand, uh, you, you prune them in March, you fertilize them in April, and you harvest them in October, and you take them to the mill, and, and they get pressed into oil. So they're a lot easier. But the neighbors said, no way. They said, olives don't survive up here. The winters are too cold. Besides, if they do survive, the wild boar will come along and knock them over. But I persisted, and I was right. Part of the reason has to do with climate change. I think a big part of the reason has to do with climate change. The uh, climate in general is much uh, more even tempered throughout the year than it used to be. And the winters are not nearly as intensely cold as they used to be. So it's a warming climate suitable for this, this the most Mediterranean of all plants. And this is what I get as a result. These are Lichino olives and are, uh, Although we usually like to harvest olives in Tuscany when they're just turning from green to black, these Lachinos turn black very early and they make a very, very fine oil. Uh, it was so successful that even Arnaldo, who's a consummate skeptic, uh, he planted olives on his own land and he was convinced. And here he is, he's helping with our harvest here. And uh, I think that might be Laidley Dunn in back of him. Those of you who know Laidley might recognize her forearm there. Um, and so he helps us with our harvest. We help him with his. We put all the olives together. We take them to the Frantoyo outside Cortona. And this is what we get as a result. So there's one other super important part of the Tuscan diet that I've alluded to over and over again, and it has remained only slightly changed down through the years. And that is, as they say in Italy, sua maestà il porco, his majesty, the pig. Now, I have to point out that where the Antolini farm once counted the pigs by the dozen, nowadays they are no more. Another thing that has disappeared for some time, after they stopped breeding pigs, uh, Arnaldo would buy a couple of pigs, say in September, October, and uh, fatten them up for the uh, butchering in December or January. That's traditionally when the pigs are butchered because it's the cold time of the year, obviously, and uh, would turn them into that incredible array of pork products that Tuscans boast of. This is in the market in Cortona, and you can see these are, are fairly, uh, uh, young sausages. This is an old cured, what we would probably call a salami. And these are uh, guanciale and uh, guanciale are the cheeks of the, of the pork that are cured and, and probably spalla, which are the shoulders. Not as prestigious as prosciutto, but still uh, very, very fine products. Um, I have to say that's where the Antolini family now acquires its favorite food, which is salumi in all shapes and sizes they buy on the market. But remember that in the days before electricity and refrigeration, most of that animal had to be turned into something that would last through the winter and provide the family with the protein it needed. So most of what they ate was salted meat and fresh meat because certain parts of the pig had to be consumed fresh. Fresh meat was a rarity and it was something that was turned into a feast. And when the pig was slaughtered, it was time for that fresh pork. Only with Tuscan country ingenuity, the fresh part was turned into a true festa that featured porchetta, which I often think of as the highest and best use of the family pig. These next three photos are going to take us to a slightly different part of Tuscany where the most famous butcher in the world, Dario Cicchini, holds court. This is in Chianti Classico. And here he is preparing a porchetta with my daughter, Sarah, in the midst of a cooking class. Uh, first, he's deboning the pig and you can see the bones lying here on the side that he's taking out. And he's starting to, um, to put all the kinds of savory mixtures into the insides of that pig. And 
he goes on to add phenyl pollen. Now, Dario says that phenyl pollen is the aromatic of the region of Arezzo, which is where we are in our little mountain valley. Uh, fennel pollen that comes from wild fennel and has become very popular in this country recently. Um, almost unknown 20 years ago, even in other parts of Italy, but now very much in demand. So he, he fills that uh, interior of the pork with all kinds of savory things like garlic and salt, and then he ties it up and very proudly displays it. And then it gets sent off to market and here is the porchetta in the marketing in Cortona on Saturday mornings. He slices it off and he makes a panino con porchetta, which he sells for three euros, which at the time was probably $3.50. And it is a mighty wonderful sandwich. It usually includes the skin, the crosta, some of the fat, which is very savory, and the interior bits, which often include the pig's liver chopped up in there as well. So it gets sold in the market, or it gets sold at a community festival, or it gets sold on a, on a, a, a truck by the side of the road. I wish we had food trucks like that here. Wouldn't that be great? Um, so this is outside the main gate to the main back gate to Cortona on a, a Saturday afternoon after the market is closed. And you, Mr. and Mrs. America, can drive up in your rental car, maybe if we open up all the floodgates and allow people back in again, you can drive up and order a porchetta sandwich and enjoy it while you're looking out at the view. So... Uh, even though the, you know, the Antolinis, they don't raise their own porkers any longer, but they still remain true to the tradition of pork at the center of any festive occasion. And it could be Sunday lunch with the family. This is the daughter who owns the, um, uh, you know, I'm seeing a lot of faces here and I wanna see the, yeah, this is what I wanna see. This is the daughter who owns the butcher shop in Cortona and this is Maura, uh, um, Arnaldo's wife and Maura's younger brother and her mother, but that was taken a long time ago. That is Sunday lunch. This is uh, festivities at the end of the olive harvest to celebrate a successful harvest. And here you see that platter of all those various kinds of salumi that are going to be passed around the table and people fill off on them. But whatever the occasion, the fact is that food Food remains central to Italian life, to Tuscan life, to the life of our little mountain valley. And that, grazia Dio, that is unchanging. That's what the farm is all about. That's what Tuscany is all about. That's what Italy is all about for me. Um, this is an old picture of Mita, may she rest in peace, um, offering to uh, probably it looks like she's got bread in there, but there's her pasta right out of the pot and ready to eat. And she says, buon appetito. Food at the center of life in Italy, at the table is the center of the family and hospitality, just as it was in the days of Homer and the ancient Greeks, hospitality is the central tenet of culture. Buon appetito, Mita would say, as we check our places at the table. And Arnaldo, as the Campo di Casa, continues to say that today. Buon appetito. And the Italians also say a wonderful expression that I, I, I like to conclude with because I think you need to keep this in mind. A tavola non si vecchia mai. At the table, you never grow old. That's a very good one to remember. So thank you all. I hope you have a few questions for me. Oh my goodness, Nancy, that was so magnificently narrated. Um, I am so grateful for the amount of, of work and love that you put into this presentation tonight. I am, I am really, really just, um, I, I just feel like I have such a greater understanding of that region now. And uh, I, I invite people to please go ahead and type some questions into the chat box and I'll be sure to read them aloud to Nancy in just a moment. Um, I have a question for you. If you could tell us uh, what, if you could describe what a typical breakfast, a typical lunch and a typical supper would be on a, on a weekday in, in Tuscany. Oh, well, uh, the, typical, uh, the typical breakfast is really not much of anything at all. It's usually, 
a cup of coffee with a lot of milk in it, not cream, but milk and a lot of sugar and some kind of a bun or a roll, or in this family, it would be a slice of that day old, two day old bread, maybe with olive oil drizzled over the top of it. Um, maybe with a slice of prosciutto on it, but Italian don't tend to eat very much at breakfast and they might break in the middle of the day in the middle of the morning I mean uh you know say at about 11 o'clock and if you're in the town in town you would definitely break at 11 you go into the cafe and you would have a coffee or you know if you're very bold and daring and old-fashioned you would have a, a shot glass of wine or grappa or something and you might have a little panino a little sandwich with that and then you sit down at lunch at one o'clock or 1 30 and you have almost invariably pasta. It's really extraordinary to me how much pasta Italians eat. Um, still to this day, uh, I think I think many people don't even consider it a meal unless pasta is served first. The pasta is always a separate course and it's not a huge amount. It's not like those great mounds of pasta that we have in this country. It's really uh, much more contained. And the sauce that goes with it is there to make the pasta go down. It's not, it's not the principal, um, you know, pasta is a carbohydrate after all, we need carbohydrates in our diet. So to get the carbohydrate, which is really boring to, go down, you put a little condiment on it. It might be olive oil. It might be a bolognese sauce full of meat. It might be a plain tomato sauce, but the pasta is always there. And then after that, maybe a small piece of meat or fish. But really, if you think of a deck of cards, that's the size of the meat or fish that you would eat. And after that, you'd have a salad. And dessert, more often than not, is going to be a piece of fruit. And I'm not talking about an idealized Mediterranean diet. I'm talking about the way Italians eat day after day after day, the way they eat in school, and school lunches are set up that way, the way they eat at home, the way they eat in our, 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 our company cafeteria is always like that. And then dinner, for most Italians, is a much lighter meal. And that, again, might be, it might be a soup, a vegetable soup or it might be uh, pasta again, or it might be leftovers from lunch, but it's not considered an important meal. So that's it, basically. So a, a lot of the uh, the images you showed us were, you know, some feast images with the larger trays of right. selections of, so, yeah. but yeah, it sounds like the day-to-day -day eating uh, is a lot more straightforward. Um, it is, yeah. So, uh, and, but a lot of time is spent talking about food and thinking about food, <laughs> having food. A lot. I mean, food is really central. I think, you know, we talk about the great treasures of Italy, you know, the, the statue, the Michelangelo statue of David or the Colosseum in Rome or, uh, you know, the, the, the Riace bronzes. But really, one of the great cultural uh, uh, achievements of Italians is to make, to understand that food is, is central to life and that the way food is raised and the way it's produced and the way it's treated in the kitchen uh, enhances it and makes it even more of, you know, you just, you cannot think of Italy without thinking of food. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it looks like Alexandra has the same question as I have. Um, is your olive oil for sale anywhere? No, it's not. We use some of it. We didn't get any last year. I mean, we weren't there last year. So, uh, and, and it's too, we couldn't explain to Arnaldo how to ship it to us. Usually when they're there, we ship some here and we have it at home and Sarah has some in the restaurant, but really very small quantities and she uses it, you know, to garnish things and stuff like that, but we don't make enough to sell it. Oh. Like you take 60, 70 liters and between me and my son in Portland and Sarah at the restaurant and, and the friends, and then we give away, you know, we have friends who come and help us harvest and they uh, get olive oil in return. So it really, it doesn't go very far, 60 or 70 liters. I think you just need to buy some more land and plant right. some more olive, <laughs> olive yeah, that's trees. What I need, right? <laughs> just yeah, a little I'm more gonna responsibility. <laughs> I'm going to put olive trees in. I'm going to buy some land and hope and plant olive trees up there. I will help you out. <laughs> um, Jean wants to know if you have a cookbook from these early days. So when you were first well, I guess, uh, discovering the these. that I wrote called, unfortunately, a bad title, Flavors of Tuscany is mostly, not entirely by any means, but a lot of it is about 
the Angelinis. And the photographs in the book were taken almost entirely by my offspring, Sarah and Nicholas, uh, and their photographs of the Angelini family. So if you can find it on Amazon, or you know, there might be a copy tucked away in the Camden Public Library somewhere, um, it's a really good book. Uh, Unfortunately, the publisher went out of business. That's my history with publishing, unfortunately. My publishers go out of business, my editors get fired, my agents decide they don't want to agent any longer, and I'm left high and dry with a bunch of books. Um, if somebody wanted to buy a copy of it, I might be able to find a copy out in my barn if I can get through to the where the books are. And Nancy, what's your website? Can you say it out loud, the website address? My website is very simple. It's nancyharmanjenkins.com. All right. And there is contact information on there. So you guys, so you can visit that yeah. and reach out to Nancy that way. Um, so Amy wants to know, how did you get to your home travel wise? So when you went to Tuscany, how, how would you get there? Well, I'd fly in obviously to uh, Rome or Florence. Florence is easiest because it's closest but it's still a long way. It's, you know, I get in my car or I get on the bus and I take the bus to Logan and I get on a plane and I fly to Rome and then I get on another plane and I fly to Florence and then I get on a train and I take the train to Camuchia and I get off the train and I hope that somebody is there to meet me. Um, or I rent a car. I don't do that so much anymore. You know, I'm, I'm getting so old. I don't trust myself to get off an overnight flight and get in a car and drive for a couple of hours. So I try to find somebody who can meet me rather than driving myself. That well, sounds like a big adventure to get there. <laughs> it is, it is indeed. I mean, it's a big adventure to get here in Camden too. You that's know, true, that's that. true. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so says everyone who comes to visit me from out of state. Uh, <laughs> jo Jory wants to know, do people work in town now? Do the grandparents raise the grandchildren and while parents are in Rome or elsewhere? Well, they're not in Rome, they're in Cortona. And uh, Maura, Arnaldo's wife, has a stall in the market. I, actually, I say in the market. She has a stall in Cortona on Saturdays, in Camuchia on Thursdays, and I think in one other town on Fridays. And she sells clothing. And Arezzo, which is 30 kilometers north of us, is a big center of the rag trade, oddly enough. And so she goes up there and buys wholesale and brings it down and sells it to the various farmers and so forth who come in. That's something her family has been doing. Her mother did that before her. So she kind of inherited that role. Arnaldo mostly earns his living by logging. And the other thing that the Angelinis have done, and I should mention this because this is, this is important to know, they have set up an agriturismo, a bed and breakfast at their house. And he's even put in a swimming pool. So um, I will put that name up on the, should I put that up on the library website somehow? Could I do um, that? You, you send it to me and I'll include it in the uh, description okay. for the YouTube yeah. video. Uh, because their, their place is called Il Topello, and I think it's quite charming. We often, when we have people coming to help with the olive harvest, we put them up there. So that would be fun for people to know about. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Tom writes, hi, dear Nancy, thank you for expanding again our insight to a place we love, a well-woven tapestry, love Clara and Tom. Oh, that's nice. That's okay. very nice. They stayed there many years ago. Actually, it was the year that Nita died. They stayed there. And uh, it was a very sorrowful time for me, but it was lovely to have friends like them around. Uh, Zora wrote, I saw a copy of your of your uh, cookbook at the Skadamfa Library used bookstore in Demerscada. I didn't buy it because I already have a copy. This was yesterday. All uh, right. Everyone, okay. get in your car tomorrow morning and drive to Demerscada. <laughs> and people should actually keep an eye on the uh, Camden Public Library book sale. There's constantly one going on in our rotunda, so locals may be, uh, may be having um, them there. Okay, so Helen says, hi Nancy, did you live in Woodbury, Connecticut for a time? I met no. you at Pamela's at Porgio Estruco, and I think we had dinner at a tiny place on Lake Waramog. So did you live in Woodbury, Connecticut? No, I didn't, but I know he's talking about my friend Pamela, uh, um, Pamela Sheldon Johns, who also has a wonderful agriturismo and cooking school oh, okay. in Monte Pulciano in Tuscany. And I don't remember him exactly, but I do, I'm frequently at Pamela's and I often meet people there. 
Very nice. Um, so Robert says, thanks for this. Do country Tuscans, yourself included, of course, also put tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, and other vegetables and fruits for the year? Put up um, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and other uh, vegetables and fruit for the year. I know Southern Italians do in large quantities. So what yeah. is the... Uh, what is it's the, very much a southern thing, although they do put up tomatoes. I mean, it's called pomarola, and Mita was very proud. She made 350 jars of pomarola every year, so she had enough tomato sauce to see her right through the season. Um, eggplants and peppers, they're less, they're, they're really considered something very southern, not Tuscan at all. Even though Artuzzi wrote about eggplants and called it a Jewish vegetable, which I always thought was very interesting, um, suggesting that Maybe Jews came from Spain with eggplants to Italy. Who knows? Hmm. Anyway, uh, they're not uh, typical. They're used in Tuscany, but they're not typical in the way they are in the South. Uh, fruits would mostly be turned into jams. And they make some wonderful jams from wild blackberries. That's another one of the foraged fruits that they don't sell because they're so seedy, but they're wonderful to make jam out of. Hmm. Thank you for giving us that insight into the preservation techniques. Um, Christina says, thank you, Nancy. I love hearing all this again, hugs to you. Vic says, thanks for this wonderful presentation. When you first bought the property, were you welcomed immediately or did it take time to gain trust in the community? Well, that's a very interesting question. We were welcomed immediately. And uh, we were probably the, we tied for second place of foreigners, English speaking foreigners coming into that valley. The first people were the Andersons, the second was us and the Tilsons bought it about the same time. And then after that, there were a lot of uh, mostly English, British English, I mean, not American English, buying places. And I was astounded at how uh, how we were welcomed and brought and really considered part of the community. And I tried to think about what would happen here in Camden, Maine, if a group of Italians suddenly flooded in and started buying up. Of course, we're kind of facing that now because we've got all these people from away who are coming here and buying up, but it's a little different. They're the same culture that we are. But how would we, how would we have reacted if a group of Italians, say 15 different families came here and and just kind of settled in. I think, I don't think they would have been accepted in quite the same way that we were accepted in Italy. They'd I can't explain that, it's they'd, just my feeling. They'd probably try planting olive trees and we'd just think they were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> A lot, but with our, you know, warming environment here in Maine, right. who knows? A few more years, we can plant olive trees. Mm -hmm. um, so Mia writes, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong because I don't speak Italian. Uh, ben fatto, Nancy, molto interessante, grazie, Mia e <laughs> Roberto. <laughs> that was horrible, I'm sorry. Um, Jory wants to know, is the area prosperous or neglected? Uh, it's not prosperous. Uh, prosperity comes as it does here with an influx of foreigners and the, uh, the need to uh, supply the foreigners. Although I have to say the Bottega, the shop in Teverina, has for years supplied rancid butter, um, terrible wine, uh, out of date eggs and uh, stale bread, stale commercial bread. And they continue to do that to this day. They have never ever picked up on the idea that there is a market for uh, higher class ingredients. And so uh, and they also sell gas with water in it because they have a leaky gas tank. Um, so the, that part of it is, uh, has not responded to the influx at all. Cortona, on the other hand, Cortona has changed enormously. And that's because of Francis May's Under the Tuscan Sun, which was written about Cortona and the house she bought there. And it has brought in a huge flux of foreign tourists. And the town has responded to that by... Uh, just as we've responded in Camden by closing down all the shops that once served the local community and opening instead the equivalent of t-shirt shops and souvenir shops and that sort of thing. Oh, that's awful to hear. I was it, uh, is. it is. 
Yeah. I mean, there are other there are other things going on too. One is that uh, people don't shop every day any longer, and they're looking for a place where they can park. And Cortona, as a hill town, has very little in the way of parking space, so people don't want to go there. And you know, it's, it's the people who actually live within the walls of Cortona still shop there, and the few remaining food shops. But the rest of the community will go down to Camuchia, which is down in the lower valley, and it has everything plus parking spaces. Hmm. So. It's a big change. All right, this is our last one. Deborah says, beautiful talk, beautiful photos. You make me hungry to eat that glorious food and hungry for Tuscany. Um, <laughs> I think that's a perfect note to end on. And speaking of hunger, I think we all need to keep our eyes peeled for, um, for Nancy and Sarah's new uh, porchetta food truck, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be looking for it this summer. I, can't, I have not been able to convince her, but maybe somebody else can. Porchetta food truck. It's, yeah. it's going to be a hit. Um, okay, folks, I encourage you to visit nancyharmanjenkins.com. You can see um, a bunch of resources there. You can read old articles she's written. You can learn about her cookbooks. It's just a really wonderful website. Um, and you are a really wonderful lady, Nancy. Thank you so much for the time that you put into this tonight. I truly appreciate it. And I know based on all these great comments coming in, everyone else enjoyed this too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who came. It's just great. All right. I encourage you all to visit librarycamden.org. We have a calendar there. We do programs like this all the time, most Tuesday and Thursday evenings. Um, we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff in the amphitheater this summer too. So uh, check out our website. You're always welcome. Um, and we hope you'll join us for future programs. So with that, have a good evening, everyone, and good night.